Um, our next presenter uh, has traveled quite far to be here with us today, and we're very grateful for that. Uh, Dr. Clive Aspen is Maori and is affiliated with the people of Nati Maru and his ancestral land of Hauraki. Uh, today he lives in Sydney with his partner, son, and family. And his research interests focus on indigenous health, resilience, chronic illness, sexuality, and sexual behavior. He also has a long-standing personal and professional interest in HIV within the context of indigenous health. Clive is closely engaged with a number of community-based initiatives through his work with the International Indigenous Working Group on HIV, which is hosted here in Canada by the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network, and AINA, Maori Indigenous and Pacific Island HIV AIDS Foundation. So please join me in welcoming Clive. There you go. ko tēnē te mia te ki a koutou. Ko hari mai nei ki tēnē hui, tēnē rā. Ka tino hari ko te nākau ki te ki o tātou Tuturu Devon, um, uh, I tēnei rā, nō reira he mihi tēn, tēnō pote, poto tēnei, nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou koutoua. Uh, bonjour tout le monde, je voudrais bien remercier uh, les gens qui m'ont invité à cette réunion ce matin. Um, <coughs> Je le compte un très grand privilège, un très grand honneur uh, de pouvoir vous parler ce matin. And uh, the third language, um, the language of the colonizer, I'd like to speak to you in that now. Uh, <laughs> um, I, and, and just to translate, I greeted, um, <clears throat> uh, I thanked the uh, organizers of this meeting, but I'd also like to uh, acknowledge the fact that we're meeting today on the land of the Coast Salish uh, people of this region. I would like to acknowledge their ancestors uh, because of the tremendous legacy that they have left us. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, all the indigenous people of this country, the First Nations, uh, the Inuit and the Métis people. And I would like to acknowledge their ancestors and their elders and I would like to thank, you, thank them for allowing us to meet on their land. Um, I'd just quickly like to start with a couple of questions. How many people were at the conference and heard my talk? Okay, thank you. Uh, how many uh, Aboriginal people here today? Two. Okay, thank you. Uh, you'll notice that my talk is about men with the same sex attraction. And I've deliberately chosen that descriptor because many indigenous men do not think of themselves as gay. And the point I'm going to be making during my brief talk is that there are words in our own languages that we would much prefer to use when we talk about our sexuality. So I just quickly want to tell you a little bit about me. Um, I live in a part of Sydney called Darlinghurst. Um, People outside Darlinghurst refer to it as the place that's full of homos, homos pufters, and a few lesbians. Uh, and so when they painted the rainbow flag on the street, it really confirmed for a lot of people living outside our suburb that it really was given over to perverts and people of that nature. Uh, this pedestrian crossing was actually ripped up in the dead of night about three or four days ago. So uh, people can rest assured that maybe it's not going to be exclusively gay anymore. However, I'm just showing you this image because these are the sorts of image that many of us grow up with. Uh, we see them all around, we see them in the streets here, and it really defines particular locations as possibly uh, belonging to certain people. I've heard stories about parents in remote parts of Australia or living outside the city of Sydney who's, uh, <clears throat> who once, um, when she heard that her son was going to be moving to Sydney to take up work, she was quite adamant that he not take up residency in Darlinghurst because that's where all the pufters lived. And these <clears throat> sorts of perceptions provide, uh, um, cause significant dilemmas for people from indigenous backgrounds. Uh, this is my partner, Terry, and our dog, 
Pablo. We've got two of them. Miss Ruby's the second. Uh, this is our son. And I'm showing you this image because uh, when I arrived here a few days ago, the first question I was asked was, how's your son? And that was from Terry and Rick, who knew about this child in my life uh, when he was born just over 17 years ago. So uh, this is our son, Louis, who is almost 18. And as a father, we tend to uh, judge time according to the life of our child. And so I was reminded when they asked me that question that we must have met about 15 or 16 years ago, the last time we saw each other. So it's uh, children are wonderful <coughs> additions to our lives, but they always also act as a very convenient measure uh, of time. I'm going to show you some images now that illustrate the point I'm trying to make in that we have our own words and languages to describe sexuality. Uh, many of you will be familiar with this image. Um, how many people have seen this image before? So almost half of you. Uh, <clears throat> this is a very early photo. Uh, and down the bottom it says that this is a Beardash whose name was Wiwa from the Zuni tribe uh, in New Mexico and it was taken about 1879. So in the early days of describing indigenous sexuality, this blanket term beardash was used. And as I understand it, the term came to prominence in the 60s, 70s, at the time of gay liberation. And it was a way of acknowledging that indigenous cultures and peoples had their own form of sexuality. And so in their rush to talk about this, people latched upon the word beardash, which as I understand it, uh, was first used by the seal trappers who came to this country in the early days of colonization. And the word was taken, uh, I think, from French. And in its literal sense, it meant uh, it was used to describe a catamite. And I understand a catamite is someone who sleeps at the end of your bed and you use for sexual pleasures. So this word was erroneous, erroneously uh, attached to describe same-sex attraction in the early days of a growing awareness of the importance of sexuality with regard to uh, issues around gay liberation. And as you'll see, the word beardash has, is, is inappropriate, and people have now come to recognize that there are other terms that are much more appropriate for describing same-sex attraction within indigenous communities. I particularly like this image because it reverses the roles. When we, talk, when we hear historical accounts of um, the frontier, it's usually the white man doing over the native man. But this is a great reversal and actually shows a white man enjoying the pleasures being provided by a native man. Presumably, you all know who the artist is who produced this beautiful image. So, not over here. So, Kent Monkman, uh, who I've recently discovered from my uh, visits to Canada, he has, put, he has painted some beautiful images of sexual variations and sexual diversity on the frontier in the days of colonization. Uh, this reminds me of a study also that uh, I was involved in, which uh, involved the interviewing of 11 young Māori men about their first sexual experience. Uh, the study was focused on unwanted experiences of sex among men with the same sex attraction. Of the 11 uh, people that we recruited to the study, nine said that the very first time they had sex with another man, it involved anal sex, and it involved anal sex without a condom. This study it was uh, carried out about six, six, uh, six years ago, and what that would suggest to me is that for many young indigenous men who don't know the rules, the first time they're having sex with another man, succumb quite readily to unprotected sex uh, if that's what the other man uh, forces on them. So that was particularly worrying in terms of uh, the possibility of transmission of HIV in the very early stages of one's coming to terms with his sexuality. Uh, this is an image of the very first uh, yeah, Māori uh, chap that we know of from the colonial archives. Uh, this man, his name was, oh, it's not written there, uh, but he's, um, oh, sorry, Edward Perry. His name's been, Edward Perry, his name has been transliterated to uh, conform to 
uh, English sensibilities. Uh, but the interesting thing about this is he's described as a New Zealand youth, but he's also been baptised. And the reason that he was baptised was possibly was that he was having a same-sex relationship with the local pastor, whose name was Mr. Yates. Mr. Yates. And Mr. Yates, we know from archival material that continues to survive uh, today, we know that Mr. Yates lived in cohabitation with, uh, with the young man I showed you just before this. But not only that, but Mr. Yates also had multiple relationships with other uh, young men in the village where he lived. Now, we, we can also draw from this the conclusion that the local Māori community would have condoned same-sex behaviour because were they uh, to be unhappy with his sexual relationships with other men, he would have been expelled from the village. But in the 1840s, uh, 1830s, he was allowed to cohabit with Ma a young Māori man in the town and I read that as a sense of condoning same-sex relationships within that local community. That's the only one we know about, but there would have been many, many others, I suspect. The reason we know about this was that Mr. Yates was eventually tried, uh, and he was brought before a court of law in New South Wales, and he was finally expelled back to England uh, because of his uh, same-sex relationships that he had been conducting on the ship that came from England and brought him out to uh, New South Wales on one of his return visits. Um, the local people in the village from which he was expelled were so horrified, these are the presumably the, the other white settlers in the village, they were so horrified about the revelation that he'd been having a, um, a same-sex relationship that they burned down his house and they shot his horse. And their anger, as you can imagine, must have been extremely uh, high uh, to shoot a horse in the days of, of colonialism would have been the destruction of a very valuable commodity. However, they were so incensed that he had done this uh, without them realising that they went to the extreme length of killing a very valuable horse. Uh, so we grow up with images like this. Uh, this is a very common Māori image where the genitals are on full display. Uh, this is an image of two embracing couples. These are very common. In this particular case, these are, uh, we have a, a woman on the one side and a man on the other side. And down here, this, this, this image is portrayed in the front of a meeting house. And the reason why the woman is small is because the style of the house is on a slope like this. And so for, therefore, she is portrayed as, as of smaller stature than him, but uh, more importantly is that there are several examples of two men embracing in other parts, in some parts of, of New Zealand. So that would be a man and that would be a man. And we can read that as either two chiefs united, brought together and, and united in some form of embrace. It could be read as two important brothers within a family, but it could also be read as two men with the same sex attraction, and that's the interpretation that I prefer. Uh, many of our statues and our artwork which displayed a sexuality were mutilated, and here you, this was a, uh, this, oops, wrong one. Um, this is the entrance into a village, so you walk through here, but around here you can see where the genitals have been removed. And many of the artworks from the pre-colonial days hadn't indeed had their genitals removed such as this one did. Um, there's an urban myth that exists uh, in New Zealand, and that is that there's a box full of genitals that have been cut off uh, statues, and they reside in a museum, in the basement of a museum somewhere in New Zealand. I haven't tested whether that's true or not, but it sounds like a, a feasible thing. I mean, what would they have done when they chopped off the genital of this particular artwork? Would they just throw it away, destroy it, burn it? I'm not quite sure. But somebody suggested one day that they've been kept, and it would be interesting to see if that were actually the case. Okay, so if we look at this, um, the situation of sexual, sexual diversity uh, in North America, I'll read this, and it says, on the land we know as North America, uh, there were approximately 400 distinct indigenous nations. Of that number, 155 have documented multiple gender traditions. 
Two-spirit is a contemporary term that refers to these traditions where some inv individual spirits are a blending of male and female spirit. The existence, the existence of two-spirit people challenges the rigid binary view of the world of the North American colonizers and the missionaries, not just of a binary gender system, but a binary system of this or that altogether. The two spirits' mere existence threatened the colonizers' core beliefs. The backlash was violent. Sketches housed at the New York City Public Library depict two spirit people being attacked by colonizers' dogs. Word of this brutal treatment spread quickly from nation to nation. Many nations decided to take action to protect their honored and valued two-spirit people. Some nations hid them by asking them to replace their dress. A mixture of men and women's clothing with the attire of their biological sex. After years of colonization, some of those very same nations denied ever having a tradition that celebrated and honored their two-spirit people. So what we're seeing here is the rejection or the obliteration or the, uh, white, uh, the, the total uh, um, wiping out of any form of sexual variation with the arrival of uh, religion, the arrival of institutions into colonies such as Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, the imposition of Western views of the world and Western religion in particular meant that people had to hide their sexuality and adopt to the binary system that had been brought from uh, the land of the colonizer. Well, we know in actual fact that um, we do have forms of sexuality today. Here's a couple, uh, um, two very old photos of people who would be described as two spirits. And this is a modern day version of a very famous uh, Māori transgender who passed away just over a year ago, and she lived in Sydney, came, uh, came from New Zealand, came, uh, and came to live in Sydney, and was viewed very much as an elder in the local community. Her name is Carmen. These are just some images that show, that show the diversity of sexuality. Māori in pre-colonial times were very keen and very ready to de depict uh, same-sex relations. Um, this shows genitals. These images are in the museum, uh, museum in Florence. But this shows, in good old Western style, the man on top with his penis stuck in the woman here. But in actual fact, it should have been displayed lengthways along the ridge of a building, which shows neither the man nor the woman on top. But uh, in good old Western sense, the man has to be positioned above the woman. So what do we know about Māori sexuality? And this applies to other indigenous cultures as well. Sexuality was enjoyed in many forms. People chose partners of either sex for pleasure, and same-sex love was not condemned or vilified. Over the decades of colonization, the homosexual and more certainly the lesbian became invisible. Little is known of homosexuality as it occurred in traditional Māori society. My informants universally, you sorry, unanimously assure me that the incidence of it, both male and female, was marked. And I think we could probably assume that that's definitely the case for other indigenous cultures. So the word takatapu is the word we use in Māori rather than the word gay. It uh, was found in a dictionary that was produced in 1830s. <clears throat> sorry, 1844, and its definition is an intimate companion of the same sex. This term has been taken up by people in the community today because it encompasses the sexual and cultural components of one's identity. It's used by men, women, and transgender people, and it is preferred to terms such as gay, lesbian, and transsexual. And there is increasing use of, of it within the Māori community. Um, so what's one of the solutions? Well, this was a, use, a rather interesting little quote that I found from Sean Mellows. Anyone here know Sean Mellows? Mellows? I think he's from South Africa, was he? Is he still around at conferences? He was at the 2004 conference, and he made this comment. Uh, we have to put sex back into the epidemic rather beyond just the route of transmission. There was no celebration of positive sexuality. This, he's talking about the AIDS conference in Bangkok. No celebration of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered identities. No celebration or discussion of diverse sexuality or our sexual rights. Although the issue of male-to-male -male sexual behavior made it onto the program, and we are very grateful for that, the sessions 
covered it from a behavioural or intervention perspective and did not necessarily address the sexuality and identity. And I guess there are some messages there that are being echoed by what I've been hearing here about how gay men's issues, same-sex issues get left off the agenda at many of these international meetings. So we need to focus on how we can ensure that indigenous societies flourish. We must not shy away from protecting vulnerable populations. Their vulnerability should not reduce their intrinsic worth as human beings. Social justice demands that everybody be assisted to flourish regardless of their state in life. And I quickly go through these. Uh, indigenous people and HIV, what we know about them is that there are distinct uh, disparities. Those who were at the conference on Friday will know that here in uh, Canada we have very high rates of, uh, of HIV among indigenous populations and there are disparities in New Zealand and Australia. Indig uh, indigenous peoples far, uh, have uh, challenges with regard to access to services. They're often culturally inappropriate. Uh, people don't want to go and use them because they can't be sure of anonymity and uh, they can't be sure that their cultural background is going to be respected. Uh, services should be provided for everybody and we're now starting to see significant issues around late testing. Indigenous people are much more likely to go to along and get tested late for HIV and as we know that leads to worse health outcomes. Uh, and treatment as prevention, we've had a lot of coverage of that. It's certainly not the only way to prevent trans transmission, especially among Indigenous people. These are the questions we were asked to consider, and these are my answers. So, for, in terms of Indigenous uh, people, we need to understand that much of our, many of our, much of our lives are governed by Indigenous paradigms and worldviews. We need to have methodologies in place that decolonise the way in which the world is set up and definitely the way in which we as Indigenous people see the world. Uh, indigenous research run, carried out by Indigenous people, led by Indigenous people, is going to provide much more illuminating answers and perspectives than much of the research that's been done within the last 30 years, especially with regard to HIV and especially with regard to that sort of research which uh, excludes uh, Indigenous people from samples, from analyses and from findings. Uh, we need to build Indigenous capacity. Uh, the fact that there are only two Indigenous people at this conference I think is probably a concern for some of the organisers. I would have thought that uh, ways of bringing Indigenous people into the fold, into these sorts of forums is going to be a one way in which we can increase capacity. And that applies not only here, but definitely in the country where I live in Canada and the country where I was born, New Zealand. Uh, improving and facilitating access to services is a major issue. How do we make these responsive in a cultural manner? And we all should be working towards the elimination of disparities, which I've referred to, and which everybody, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, needs to be committed to if we're really going to make a difference. Uh, these are just two uh, carving uh, um, artworks. Um, was this made before or after colonisation? I'm just testing you here. Any ideas of whether this would be before or after colonisation? He's still got his genitals. But the, uh, the, the answer is after colonisation because he's wearing a hat. What about this one? Would this be... <laughs> is this pre or post colonisation? Yeah, well, it's in a museum. Uh, but this is probably at the time of colonisation because it's a bit dark there, but he's actually lost his penis as well. And finally, uh, I'm going off to Thailand in a couple of days, so I'll be thinking of you from there. Um, but if anyone's been to Thailand, you can see you can have some very interesting massages. So it's the land where anything goes, and even a testicle massage. I've never, uh, practiced, I've never had one, have no idea what it's like, but if you uh, get to Thailand, it might be worth trying. And then I'm going to go to the beach, and I'm going to hang out with these two people, my partner and our friend Van. So think of me on Friday as I'm lying back on the beach. If you want to contact me, these are my contact details. And this is a way of saying thank you. Kia ora. Thank you. Merci beaucoup.